Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar on introduction to vulnerability management. We are with Rita Whitfield. Uh, Rita is a Microsoft, Cisco, CompTIA, EC Council and ISC2 certified instructor. Um, she has a number of certifications, but the most uh, relevant to this session is the CompTIA uh, security analyst. Uh, CompTIA cybersecurity analyst and then CompTIA security analytics expert uh, certification and professional certification. Uh, she's also a certified ethical hacker. She's got eight years of experience in the networking and security industry and she's been uh, working in the software and database management industry for five years now. So uh, uh, I, I believe uh, we are in for a very educational session. Uh, related to cybersecurity, and it's very helpful for people who are preparing for a CompTIA certification, especially. Uh, so, Rita, thank you for joining us, and please take it from here. Thank you for introducing me. Hi, guys. I'm very excited to join you guys this evening. Hopefully, you get some basic concepts of vulnerability assessment to kind of help you if you are currently in the field, um, helping you with your vulnerability assessments at work, or if you're trying to get into the industry, what is it actually that companies are looking for if they're trying to hire you to be their security analyst or network person? What are they actually expecting you to kind of know uh, when troubleshooting their networks or getting started? So we're going to hit a couple of topics here, uh, which normally I think it works both ways. Some companies are unaware that they have vulnerabilities or they even exist. Um, some people actually are a little bit oblivious to it, so just they just don't know based on the industry and because the attacks haven't happened to them or they haven't been hit yet, they think it's non, you know, irrelevant. They don't have to do it or they don't have to worry about it. So we're going to go through um, lack of knowledge, just, just not having an educational background experience so you don't know to do it. <clears throat> we're also going to go through scanning methods. A lot of people worry about compliance and regulation, which you should, but some things that impact your business and critical functions also should be scanned and checked for. And then you have things that you have in place that also affect that. So based on your lack of scanning technique, that can also present some problems as well. Uh, we're gonna go through some basic assessment and compliance issues. This is just, just a little bit of awareness. Just what can you do to make sure you save and regulatory compliance, and also following your internal security policy, okay? Um, how do you prioritize? Because you have to think of budget. You have to think about what's most critical in your environment because every business is different. So what one vulnerability assessment is in one company, even if you guys are still part of the same industry. So if you even have different banks. They all have different internal policies regardless of compliance or regulatory. So being aware of what you should prioritize versus someone else. So looking at trends and analysis. And then this, uh, business risk. So uh, business assessment, uh, risk assessment. So some of the standards that we have to go through, the life cycle. So you have to practice these things until in a life. Basically, when you're no longer engaging in the activity, no longer dealing with the product or hardware. And last but not least, uh, we have to look at the attack methods. So this will, I think overall, once we finish going through these basic concepts, it'll give you a, a kind of basic intro to vulnerability management and <clears throat> I can go over some basic tools and everything as well that you guys can use. It's pretty popular in the industry. Uh, for the most part, companies will be using these uh, to kind of go through uh, what compliance and scanning and so forth. So, and then we'll take uh, like the last 10 or so minutes of the, um, webinar, we'll go ahead and hit some questions or any concerns that you guys are dealing with now that you need me to add, or just general information. We'll go over that as well. So we'll have a basic Q&A um, as well to address anything that you guys want to kind of go over that I didn't hit. Okay, so let's get started. So first thing is most people will say, well, what good is a vulnerability assessment? Why do we need it? Okay, so first of all, you need to identify patterns in your network so that you can avoid breaches. Most people think, hey, a breach hasn't happened to me, so I don't have to worry about it until it happens. And actually, that's a little too late. So you want to look at trends and things that's happening in your industry as far as in the same business. Um, or you also want to look at if you're adopting new technology. 
So anything as far as with mobile component. Uh, and now the big thing is Internet of Things. So if you guys are adopting anything new, you need to think about the risk that comes along with it. Um, what are we introducing into our environment? So looking at patterns, trends, and analysis definitely will help. Now, proactive is what you guys will be, okay? For the most part, you don't want to breach. Hopefully, you never have one. That's the goal, but we already know anything you introduce into your environment is always a risk factor. No such thing as zero risk. If it was, you wouldn't need you guys. But Anything, your job is to minimize those risk factors, not to eliminate them because there's no such thing as that. So you want to bring it down to where it's not a walk in the park. You know, you don't want to make it easy for the attacker to breach your environment. So some things you need to do ahead of time so a breach doesn't even happen. So you want to take proactive measures. So it's things that you have to think about when you're implementing something. How do you secure it? How do you lock it down? How do you make sure you're following your three goals of security, which you're going to hit in a second? And then last but not least, did you do it correctly? Okay. How do you know that? Do you look at your metrics? Do you do your scans? Do you do your reports every week? Do you look at your logs daily? So most people don't do that until an actual breach happens. Where if you was doing this on a consistent basis, you probably would have caught it ahead of time or the attack wouldn't have been as bad. So some things I know in some cases out of our hands to kind of do it every single day. But if you can kind of deploy that and make sure it's happening every day, that's like best practices. And you can maintain your environment a little bit better instead of waiting until last minute. So here's my 10 uh, golden steps to trying to figure out what's the proper or the things that she, you should be doing for a vulnerability assessment. Uh, most important thing, I always say asset discovery. Um, got 10 different ways on how you can do this. And I think all 10 should be done at some point in time. I'm not necessarily saying that you have to do it in this order, but it will be productive to kind of do it this way. Now, the first thing is I can't tell you what your vulnerabilities are if I don't even know what you have. So you as a manager or the person who is invested in the company or the CISO, whoever's in charge of the security plan, they have to figure out what do they have? Like what is in my environment? So you as a manager may have to take an active role in determining what are your business processes. What are the critical things to make your business run? What are some things that are important to your business? And you got to think about it from each department, not just, okay, from a manager perspective, but what functions happen in each department? What happens if those things go down? Are we still able to maintain? Or do the business stops running? So your goal is to maintain business continuity, but you have to take an active role to analyze every single process that's critical in your environment. You know, normally most people only think about one thing, but you got to think about every single department. What is their function? What is their role? You know, what is your most critical thing? Is it email? Is it the fact that you have a database server? Is it that you have web services? What is critical in each environment? And then you analyze it from that perspective, okay? Um, then we have uh, identity and understanding your business process, what I just mentioned. Pinpointing what applications and what data uh, is dependent on each other. So looking at dependencies. So if this one component fails, what else fails in the environment? Or is that a standalone item? Or if this feature fails, what else does, does that affect in my environment? So you want to look at dependencies and processes throughout. If one department goes down, does it just affect that department or is that multiple departments across the board? Because if they go down, everybody else can't do their job. Um, you want to find any hidden data sources. And we'll go over what I mean by that. I'm just kind of running through a list here, but I'm definitely going to go into more detail and explain this. Um, what hardware underlies and applications and data? So what hardware you have running, okay? Um, your network infrastructure, very important. How do you have things wired? How do you have everything connected? Are you just internal? Are you using third party suppliers, cloud? Um, identifying what you already have. You may have to adopt some security features, but you always use what's in-house first. Number one golden rule so you can get along with your managers is always to save company money. Most people think, oh, let's always spend. You know, they always think IT is kind of like, you take away from the business because you're always buying and buying and buying. And managers are looking for, if I'm going to buy it, I want it to be a return on investment. I want it to be something that will last. 
So they look at IT as the people who spend the money and managers are always trying to bring in revenue. But you guys got to come to a balance. You got to figure out how you can meet your business goal, but still also meet the IT security goals as well, okay? And then you have your scans. Some of the scans you're going to have to consider if you are outsourcing to other third parties, how do you see if they're, you know, doing what they need to to make sure your vulnerabilities are taken care of. you using cloud, different things. So we'll go over that. Uh, business and technology, okay? What am I using there? As far as do I know how to actually read those scan results? Some people don't can't interpret scans very well. So if you read it incorrectly, then you don't patch it correctly or so forth. So we have different ways to do that. And then last but not least, once you've done, done your job, um, right before you get audited or so forth, it's always recommended. Anything that you implement, once you do your vulnerability assessment, probably nine times a ten, you should probably consider doing some type of pen test. Okay. Um, now, if you have someone skilled on staff, great. If not, even though it may be somebody skilled on staff, you still want to probably consider outsourcing that activity because you may have like a biased opinion. So use an internal. Would it be cheaper? Yes. Uh, would it be less work because the person already knows the environment? Yes. But it also can lead to bias opinion. So you want to make sure that it's outsourced if possible. Um, that way you get an unbiased opinion about the network. Um, you'll get a real actual view of uh, attacker from external coming in. So it you know, just depends, but you should want to consider that as well. So let's take a look at this in more detail. So when you're looking at assessing yourself, okay, um, you're looking at the critical, um, this is your first critical step. You can't go any further until you know your inventory. What do I have? What do I need? How do I function? Um, so if you guys go into management, decide to take later on like risk uh, management framework, RMF, pretty popular. Or if you decide to take uh, CISSP, also pretty popular. They go through that in big detail. You cannot do anything unless you understand your business and what it's capable of doing and how it functions. So you got to do your strategic goal. You got to do your tactical. You got to do your operational. That outlines the mission, the goals, the objectives. So that's the first step. Can't do anything without that. Okay. So most managers are concerned with being compliant and making sure that they're following all regulatory law guidelines. And there's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, you don't actually have a choice. You have to. But you need to consider also other elements, not just always following compliance and regulatory and law, but you also came up with an internal security policy. So not only do you need to follow what's mandated by you, but you got to make sure whatever you documented and said that you were going to do is also being followed. So you have to follow both elements, mandatory and what you specify within your own environment that you would like your users to follow to reduce your risk factor. Okay. So we got to look at it from business risk and also budget is also a factor. Because, uh, again, you may have more risk than what you can actually spend or have budget for. So this is where the prioritizing come into place. Like, hey, I have to do my most critical, which means whatever your asset is, the one that's the most valuable, definitely more crucial to your business function. And let's say on that server, you find 20 or 30 different vulnerabilities. Now you rank your vulnerabilities. So looking at this little example here, I tell you, hey, you do your inventory. And let's say you've you know, got a couple of servers. And one of those servers happen to be for your data storage, okay? So your asset will be your data storage server, and then we'll analyze that, okay? So I broke it up into three categories here. Now, you have a choice of how you want to do this, but these are probably three areas that would be more important to you. Of course, you can kind of map it out and go a little further into detail of, uh, by all means. But the first thing is, on that data storage server, what are the vulnerabilities, Okay. Now, would you be able to probably discover all the vulnerabilities? Probably not, because depending on the scanner that you're using, if you're using one that is uh, based off of predefined, which means it's already pre-built with a predefined database, then you're highly dependent on the vendor. So if the vendor is not pushing out updates or so forth, it's not going to scan for anything that's unknown. So you may have some zero days or you may have some things that may flag, it may be a threat or may not be a threat. So, but at the least, you're going to get something back, 
Okay, so I did my vulnerability scan and I decided, okay, one of the vulnerabilities, and let's say we haven't even got to a point where you bought software. Just think about some of the things that can happen on that database server. So if I take a, a piece of paper, and I just kind of write it out, because sometimes they say mapping it out helps. So if I say, okay, my first asset is a data storage server, okay? Then we'll have the vulnerability, okay? The vulnerability will be the fact that I can have somebody unauthorized access data storage on or access the data on that server, okay? Now, what will be the consequences? So for every vulnerability, you got to think of about the impact, the consequence to that. So, okay, so we'll get unauthorized access to that data server. What's going to happen? Okay, I could lose my reputation because now I have customers or company or even employee data now being exposed. If that gets out to the public that I was able to not secure that data, that can lead to losses. That can lead to me losing business. Customers not trust me anymore with their information. And then leave it. And eventually I'll start to fall from there financially. Okay. Um, I might also get hit with penalties from the actual institute as far as regulatory compliance, depending on what type of data it was. So if I'm dealing with explicit TI, I'm mandated to encrypt that data and also protect it as far as with storage. So explicit PII, for those that don't know that term, that will be anything that's not public knowledge. So that will be things like social security, uh, credit card, banking, routing. Okay, so things like that then yes, I have to protect it um, and also inform you if it get exposed. Contextual is more public knowledge. I still am liable for that data, but I won't have to do as much security because it's already public knowledge. So you have to think about the type of data that's on that storage uh, server. Now, what are some of the threats that can happen? How could that possibly happen where an unauthorized person get access to it? So now you list out your threats. What could have led to that? And okay, software, malicious software, and that could be malware. Maybe somehow malware got onto the server, which allowed that person to expose the data. Um, social engineering, maybe calling up my company, contacting somebody that deals with servers and pretending to be someone in management, pretending to be a supplier or vendor, and then they ask the information over the phone and they give out too much. So proper training will be there uh, for that. Uh, what about the trusted insider? Most people don't believe, but your biggest threat is your own employee. And it's really hard to kind of monitor that because for the simple fact, they have access. So your security appliances like your firewalls, your IDS, they normally don't go off with things that are correct. So they are in the finance department, for example. They have access to a finance server, but they're stealing funds or extracting data. Technically, your firewall, your IDS, and so forth won't go off because guess what? They have the proper permission. And you have other things that you can use, like DLP, data loss prevention, to restrict people from doing things like that. But you have to buy additional things. So that brings me over to not using the proper devices means you won't catch your threat or your attack. So some people need to know what device does what. Because not all devices handle all security threats, okay? Um, the next thing you have is your virtual environment, okay? So uh, virtual attacks. You know, maybe your store, that server is not even local. Maybe it's with cloud. Or maybe they was able to remote into the server because you didn't lock it down, okay? You didn't secure your remote access. We you use things like Telnet to allow people to remote into the server. Or you didn't use a strong password, okay? And then last but not least, physical. They actually got a hold of the server. Maybe they was able to walk in and steal the whole server. Or maybe they was able to just go in, plug in a USB and extract the data. All these things you have to think about. You have to think about the attacker. What is it that your company have a value? And if you were a bad guy, how would you attack the network? Sometimes you got to step outside the box and act like you are the threat so you'll know how to secure it. Most people don't think like the bad guy. And they only think about it from an IT perspective. Sometimes you have to think like the bad guy in order to protect your information, okay? So I know you guys are familiar with this wonderful CIA trod, okay? This little triangle here is what we call our three goals of security, okay? So you have confidentiality, uh, integrity, and availability. Now, do they have to be done in order? No. 
But you as a security professional, if you're not implementing these, you're definitely going to have vulnerabilities and threats in your environment. And that's going to lead to risk factors and impact and all this other breaches that may happen along the way. So if I'm dealing with confidentiality, what is my number one goal for confidentiality? Is protecting stuff from being accessed and authorized. That means I'm going to look for encryption. That's your number one goal. Now, do you have other confidentiality controls? Of course. But encryption is number one. And what you're trying to protect will be how strong that encryption needs to be versus lenient, okay? So you have to make a decision on what you can use for encryption. So as far as the data type, now most people will go high end if it's explicit, which you should. And if you follow in a framework, they're gonna mandate you to use certain type of encryption depending on the database and what you adopt, okay? Or the data. Now, other things I can use, ACL, uh, permissions, okay? Those are also very uh, good for confidentiality controls and data classification, all that works. But you have to specify something to make sure that that data is not author, um, accessed unauthorized. Next, we might have integrity. This is just making sure data is not tampered with, deleted, or changed without proper permission or proper authentication, okay? So here, you'll be doing things. Number one technique for this is hashing. So you'll be able, remember, we're going over all proactive measures. So your goal is to make sure all this stuff is in place so that nothing can happen later, okay, hopefully, all right? So we'll do hashing. Hashing should co uh, confirm whether or not something's been changed or tampered with. And I know always people think of files and so forth, but actually it helps with malware analysis. If malware getting on your system, if you did hashes of your system files, if you did ha you can do verifications for software. You could do secure code. You can do so much stuff with hashes. It's not about downloading files and running against it. You can actually check to see if malware has changed the system because the hash will change. So you want to do it for that as well. And then we have availability. A lot of people don't think that's important, but you know, data is useless unless I can get to it. So most companies work off of what we call six nines or higher. Some people five. But the higher the nines, and by the way, that means 99.999% uptime availability. So you're looking at no more than five minutes of downtime in some cases across the calendar year. So there's no way humanly possible I can do that by myself. It probably takes me five minutes to read an email, <laughs> another five minutes to figure out what happened. I'm past my deadline, okay? So what can I implement that will maintain my environment while I figure out a solution, okay? And that will be fault tolerance and redundancy, okay? And I don't think that should be a hard thing because nowadays most companies are not, you know, in a situation where they got one server, one router, one switch. So I don't think that will be too, you know, too hard for you to accomplish. But sometimes like having outsourcing, having multiple of those may be a little difficult because it's going to become expensive. So just think about if your ISP provider goes down, you have no internet. But if I had a secondary ISP, then I'm, I'm okay. What if one of your cloud solutions go down? But if I have another cloud provider, I'm okay. But that can be really expensive. You know, what if my main site go down? Do I have a backup site? So those are things that you want to consider, along with extra routers, servers, and all that stuff. That would help as well, okay? Now, here I just did a little cheat sheet for you, and we like to call this what we, a defense in depth. These are all your proactive measures. So when you're discovering what you have in your environment, what's critical to your environment, and you assessing who you are as a company, you need to think about defense in depth. Don't just do one security control. Because what if I'm really good at that bypassing that one control? Now I'm in. Your job, like I said, you can't eliminate risk, but you can make it hard. Your job is to make it not like a walk in a park, okay? So let's say, for example, you implement username and password. I'm good at cracking passwords, so now I'm in. But if you did username, passwords, and you had like a key fob or a smart card, the person will physically have to lose that. And then I will have to also compromise the username and password. But then if I do a little step further, let's say they did lose the card, and I have the card, I have the credentials. Now, what if I implement biometrics? Again, you're going to probably hit, your attacker's going to probably hit a point where they're going to basically 
can't crack everything. You can't be good in everything. So one of these things is they go is going to hit them with a wall. Like, oh, wait a minute, I don't know how to compromise this device, or I don't know how to bypass this. So the more security controls you put in place, that means the more likely it is they either going to do two things. They're either going to get to a point where they can't compromise because they don't understand the technology or understand the device or what you implement it, or they, they pretty much just give up. They're just tired of jumping through loops. But I will tell you this. If the person really wants your data, there's no stopping them. That's why there's no such thing as zero risk. It just all depends on the determination of that person is trying to get to your data. But just because they're determined don't mean they won't hit little barriers along the way if you protect it correctly, okay? So this is just using various security controls and showing you in your three categories of administrative, technical, physical. You know, you have your sub classes, preventive, detective. You want to do all of those things. And um, you want to kind of map your controls to your tactics, to your tools and everything. Because sometimes your controls can actually hinder you when you're trying to do your own vulnerability assessments and your own scans. Like certain firewalls can block a scan type. And then you think nothing's there, but actually nothing came back because the firewall wouldn't let the scan go through. So you have to realize your security things you put in place to stop people also stop you as well. So you have to make sure you configure these things to allow the scans to work, but also do their job. And that's, I think that's where the, the kind of like the, the lack of knowledge comes in the place where person like, hey, I follow all the things to secure and lock it down and make sure nobody gets in. Now, when you're running your scans and your reports, you're not getting back accurate results, which actually gets you in trouble with your audits. They're like, hey, this came back as a false positive. This came back as a false negative. You're like, wait, wait, wait. And it's all because the devices did not properly scan it because it didn't allow it to go through. So we're going to talk about that as well. So you got to map your security controls to know your tools, your tactics, your methods in the inside as well, okay? Now, one model nobody ever talks about, and this is why I say you got to think about, like, the bad guy. Uh, this model is the dad model, okay? D-A-D -D is what I like to call it. And uh, dad goes against CIA. So you use your good guy model. That's proactive. And guess what? If you don't do your proactive measures, your bad guy will use dad. Okay, so you have uh, disclosure, which goes against confidentiality, which means either you lack the controls for confidentiality or you just didn't implement them. And so now they was able to get access to data that they shouldn't. Um, then we have alteration that goes against integrity. And integrity means I was able to change, manipulate or so. Okay, and then we have destruction. And destruction goes against uh, what we would say is your, it goes against your availability. So if I'm able to do denial of service attacks or bring down your environment, or if I'm able to stop resources from working or type your servers, eventually cause it to lag and eventually crash, then yes, you didn't do your availability options, which is doing things to back up and maintain you to have an, enough resources where you're not compromised in that way. Okay. Uh, then we have uh, our wonderful little risk uh, vulnerability and threat equation here. So, with vulnerability uh, and threats, we have uh, internal. Always look at internal is because you should be doing your vulnerability assessments yourself. Um, if not, you should be hiring someone. Uh, to come in to look at or assist you with it, but usually your IT staff can do a vulnerability assessment. So I always say it's internal factors that you're looking at. So I always keep definitions really short and sweet because it makes you clearly understand what it is that your goal is when you're doing a vulnerability assessment. You're looking for weaknesses or flaws, okay? Sometimes you create those, sometimes you adopt them, and sometimes it's like both, you know? Is you and the vendor, is you and the software developer. You know, it could be shared between both parties, and sometimes it's either or. And then you need to realize weaknesses and flaws can come in software, hardware, and people. So, you're, you know, again, people are part of this equation. So, you just can't always, again, lack of knowledge. You're only thinking attacks come in one method or 
being analyzed from one angle, okay? So you have lack of updates. That can be both parties. That can be the vendor and you. If they don't push out updates, then you can't push out updates to your, you know, your system. So let's say, for example, if I'm using antivirus. If they don't push out updates to the antivirus definition file, you can't get an update to stop the newest malware. So you're dependent on them. But let's say they did push out the update and you didn't take the time to do it. Now that's on you. So it can be on both sides. Um, you have default configuration. That is on you. Uh, most people think that's a vendor thing, but technically that's you. Um, Microsoft, for example, he doesn't build his product with you in mind. There's thousands of people, millions of people that use Microsoft products. He is building a generic brand. And then he says, hey, I give you all the tools. You build it based on how your network works. So, yes, I may have some things enabled that may not be for you. It's your job to turn those things off. Maybe for the next company, what I have enabled works for them. So he can't go around thinking about every single person, every company. It is your job to lock it down according to your business needs. So that's on you. Uh, lack of malware protection, okay? Again, on you, okay? Um, now, you don't install antivirus in your system. That can be on you. Um, the updates could be shared by both. Like I said, that could be adopted by where the vendor didn't push it out to you, so you didn't push it out, okay? Now, other threats. So threats will be anything that go against your CIA, so your confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So anything that may compromise that is considered a threat. Now, I always look at this from external, okay? So you want to look at it from external coming in. And think of, uh, you got a couple of different things that's out of your control again and some things you can control. So environments will always say, you can't control that. You can't control the weather, nor can you predict the weather. But just because you can't control the weather and when it happens doesn't mean you shouldn't prepare for it. So you still should have things like ups, generators, um, you know, additional things that, you know, if you're in an area where there's tornadoes or, you know, earthquakes or stuff like that, that stuff you need to make sure you prepare for to move your people just in case. So just because you can't predict the weather doesn't mean you don't prepare your environment for it. Um, think of structure. So we are thinking about equipment, uh, software, failures. You should have extra components, um, stuff uh, as far as spare parts. Um, some people, again, may have where they have a warm site, hot site, or a cold site. You can also use that in cases of environmental threats as well. Um, accidental, it happens. Everything is not intentional. Everything, everyone's not always trying to be the bad guy. So you have some employees who make some mistakes, you know, may trip over a cable, unplug the server. Maybe, you know, outside of your building, you know, electric people hit a gas pipe or something that knocks out power for your, your whole block. Everything is not always, oh, I'm trying to attack. But accidents do happen and you still can't say, oh, it was an accident. I didn't think about that. You still have to prepare for those too. And then adversary, or that would be more of your competitors, suppliers, uh, groups, you know, they're liberally trying to do stuff. So, of course, that will be intentional, okay, direct. Now, your risk factor, okay, they can only be a risk if you have both qualities. That means that you have a threat and you have a vulnerability. If either one of those are eliminated, then you have no risk. If both are there, you have a risk. And nine times out of ten, you always have both factors. So you have to have both there. And the only way to basically say you have no risk, which means you did not engage in the activity at all. You did your proper risk assessment, which is part of risk management, going through that whole RMF. And you decided based on the things that you discovered before you adopted it or implemented it, what you actually, uh, are we going to keep it? Are we going to you know, transfer it? Are we going to mitigate it? Or are we just not going to do it because it's too much of a high impact? Okay, so when you're doing your evaluating your security risk, you're almost basically going through and just analyzing all the possibilities of what could happen, what resources will maintain it. And you may have in some cases where you're going to do a risk assessment along with the vulnerability assessment. Some people do the vulnerability assessment first so you can determine all these things. And then we talk about, OK, what's the impact if I decide to keep it? OK, now with your vulnerability assessment. No one's going to manually walk around doing all of this. 
So we have some scanning techniques, okay? So this is going to be uh, two categories for this. You have what we call passive, and we also have active, okay? So passive, you always gather in information, um, but not necessarily connecting to the network. So a lot of people internal, like your IT, most of them won't do passive because they're like, oh, well, you know, that's not really for us. That's like what your attackers would do to find out information about us. And this is why you should do it. So I don't always have to connect to the network to see how I'm being exposed. So you want to use what we call open source intelligence. Use public resources to figure out whether your data is leaking. Figure out how much information is on the Internet that people know about. Figure out if it's on social media. Figure out if it's on job sites. Did you just expose too much of your company? Okay. So actually passive is you footprinting your network from a different perspective. Okay. You want to do that. You want to look at it from a perspective of, hey, I don't always have to directly connect. Because guess what? Before your attacker finds out information about you, he's not directly connected. So he has to do his footprinting. And which leads him to being able to directly connect to your network. So if you see how you're exposed to the public, maybe you can stop it before they can. So passive is actually very important. Most people always just do your scans. Okay, you're doing your scans as if you're already connected. But passive is looking at it from, hey, how do they even know how to connect? How do they even know what I was using? Because it was on the internet. It was using open source discovery, which wasn't locked down. So you want to do what we call threat hunt. Think like an attacker. Footprint. You have to. You have to know how you've been exposed. Most people don't do that. Okay. So, where can I go? Number one place I can go for passive footprinting. I always tell people job sites. Job sites is the number one method. You know why? Because you have no choice but to tell me what you're using. Because if you don't, you're going to have every person who's not qualified sign up for the job. You kind of don't say anything. You don't tell me, oh, you need to be, you know, familiar with servers and so forth, okay? In that case, why would I possibly, you know, not put that information because then I'm going to get resumes and people that's, you know, that's not skilled because I didn't really give the details that I needed for that person to have to apply for the job. So this is like a gold mine for your attackers. So if you look at Monster Jobs, USA Jobs, Indeed, all those sites, and you're going to look. Now, most of you say, well, Rita, how would you do that? You know, who wants to scavenge job sites all day, you know, just to see if I'm on there? There's two ways you can do this really quickly. Uh, if you are the person who's doing it for your company, then you put in your company name to see if your company has any job postings. And if they are advertising any jobs, your company jobs postings will pop up. So that'll eliminate all the searching right there. So you'll search by your company name. If you're doing this as a contractor for someone else, and you search by their company name. If I'm the bad guy, I'm going to search on my target, which means whoever I want to attack, I'm going to search by the company name to see if they posted in the job. So I don't want you to think they're sitting there going through every single job because they're not. They're doing it based on what they're looking for, criteria. Now, let's say I don't have anybody in mind I don't really know who I want to target, then I'm going to look for IT jobs. So I'm going to look for the people that will give the most information. So I'm going to put in firewall admin, security analyst, network admin, system engineer, system administrator. So I'm going to use all networking jobs. You know why? Because they will tell me what they're running. So if I look up a firewall admin, nine times out of 10, you're going to tell me whether I need a CCNA, you want to tell me I need to be familiar with Juniper, Cisco. You might even tell me the iOS. You'll tell me the model numbers that you're using. Be familiar with a Cisco switch, 3500. Uh, you'll tell me if you're using DACP, Active Directory, what type of firewalls you're running. Most people don't realize how much detail they put in the job announcement. You done told me everything without me doing a scan. Now that you gave me model number, you gave me all that information, now I research it. And then I look it up for vulnerabilities, okay? So you have various sites that you can use, like CVE, Common Vulnerability Exposure. You have Exploit DB, that you can look up all these different things. So if you discover it before them, then you can fix it. 
Now, think about who does these job announcements. It's not us. It's HR. So HR think they have to give all this information when they don't. What's wrong with saying, instead of you saying, uh, must be familiar in Windows 10, uh, Enterprise Edition, or so forth, right? Why did you have to give so much detail? Why can't you just say, must be familiar with Windows environment? It still tells me I need to be familiar with Windows, but I don't give out my model, my information, what version I'm using. I don't give out all that. So that's really big for a tackle. Which Windows? Is it XP, Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10? And if it is Windows 7, is that professional edition? Is that enterprise edition? Is that home edition? And if it's professional, is that Service Pack 1 or Service Pack 2? You see how much leeway you leave open for them to think about? But if you're so detailed, trying to be really straight, you know, it's too much. You, you don't have to get that much information out, okay? Um, and all these things that you see there, you'll see all of that in the job announcement. Some have gotten better, which means they stopped putting as much information, which is a good thing. I mean, if you need to be particular when that person or you're interested in that person when they submit their resume, then you can add some more details once you go through the, uh, you know, the, rest, the whole interview process. Or you can do a phone interview and you can ask some more details over the phone before you call them in. But just to put that out there in the open, you know, there's nothing wrong with me as being a bad guy going on Indeed and looking at what you guys got out there. It's, you're not breaking any laws. But, you know, you start to break the law later on down the line when you use that to your advantage. But I wouldn't be able to if you never put it on the Internet. So that's what I mean by you exposing yourself. So using passive is actually better trying to figure out how people got into your environment. Oh, it's because I told X, Y, Z, that's how they was able to figure it out. And if you don't even know how you're exposed to the public, how can you lock it down internally to know what to stop or block, okay? So job sites, number one. All right, now, once you use uh, active, so let's say we did all our passive stuff, I went out and figured out, oh, they exposed me in all these different ways, okay? So now we look at active network scanning, okay? So that will be, now I can use my tools. I can use my port scans. Port scans usually can tell you what well, hosts are up and running, give you service, verification, okay? That's basically what I was talking about, um, what we call banner grabbing. So just telling me you're using Windows 7 does nothing. But telling me the version of Windows 7 gives me a little bit more detail. Because if I'm trying to do an exploit, Windows 7 is not enough. I need to know. What version of Windows 7, what service pack you have installed, updates, and so forth. That helps me figure out in more detail what export I can use. If I run the wrong export against your system, I end up corrupting the data or not work before I can even use it to my advantage. Okay, so they have to know that. Um, operating system, and then we kind of map out the topology. Uh, you can use that with a port scanner as well. It's always uh, what we call network mapping. And it's a way for us to trace like where probably your firewalls are or how far I'm in for your default gateway so you have time to live that you can look at, okay? So if I'm doing network mapping, you have a couple of different things you can use. Uh, if you're looking at it from your network devices, you can use something called SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol. Please make sure you're using version 3. Version 3 supports authentication and encryption. Version 1 should not be used. doesn't support either of those things. That means anybody can tamper with your law, so get into it. Version 2, authentication only, okay? Uh, no encryption, right? Now, another one, um, and that's, uh, you can use that as a server. Um, you can implement it on your router, your choice. Uh, but you should do remote logging, which means make sure the logs are stored off of that device. Uh, you also have... Uh, MS System Center, um, that's for more enterprise management, or you can do HP OpenView. Um, and most popular tool, um, and it is free and also licensed, uh, jobs use licensed versions, that will be NMAP, okay? Um, NMAP will give you all of those features, port scanning, host discovery, and network mapping, okay? So these are some basic commands uh, that can help you identify targets in your environment. Um, so you have uh, port scanning, uh, you have uh, where you can figure out if there's DNS, like finding information about your DNS server. Um, you have a SIN scan, um, you have sparse scanning where you can actually go through and scan for certain types of logs. Because again, logging is a lot. 
uh, where you just got so much data, it just kind of all collides together. So unless you're using like a SIM solution, trying to go from this log to this log to this log, it's a lot of information. So maybe you're only looking for certain things and you don't have time to sit there and look at each line in the log. So you should be able to do that. Um, you have idle scanning and also fragmented. Um, these are also methods your attacker can use. Um, some of these methods uh, can be blocked by IDS, uh, IPS, and a firewall. Not just any old firewall because you have different types. You can block it with a stateful firewall. Um, so this is another thing, knowing what each firewall does. So you have different types. Um, knowing what devices block certain things. Some people say, oh, just buy a firewall. Okay, basic firewalls, like a packet filter firewall, does nothing for attacks. All it looks at is what's coming in, what's going out. It can't even look at the data packet. It can't tell you if it's encrypted. It can't tell you nothing. So buying a basic firewall, it does nothing if you are going against attack. So knowing those things help. Okay? Um, permission and executive support goes back to management. So scanning does cause problems. How often you scan, what type of scans. And how many devices? And then we got license issues as well. So um, some people don't do it as often because of these things. They're like, okay, well, we're going to do scans once a month. And that might not be a, a good enough idea, uh, especially if you're going through breaches a lot. Maybe if you're not a person that's experiencing that, once a month will be okay. But you can't base it off the fact that, oh, I'm just not going to do it because the scan takes too long or so forth. But those are factors that people use, oh, licensing issues. It takes too long. Um, it's too intense. It's going to slow up the performance of the network. You have to do it at some point, okay? Um, and then you have to look at it as various scans can interfere with service providers, okay? So you have to adjust that, you know, see what check with your service providers and scans. If you're dealing with cloud providers, they don't let you scan on their environment. You have to check all that in your SLA and adjust it accordingly, okay? Uh, mapping, like I said, you'll be looking at the TTL. So this is time to live, making sure you got some basic commands if you're not blocking them at your firewall, because some people block pings, some people block trace route. You know, you can block those things. But if you're not, you can use those things for troubleshooting. And if you're not blocking them, then so can your also your um your attacker. Because it's not like you need admin privileges uh to do that. But if you block a command prompt from being run, unless you're admin, you know, that's another step that you can add to your securing your uh, your host, right? Now, remember I was talking about the risk management, so that wonderful assessment, if you never did a risk assessment before, you can use like NIST 800-30, and that whole process uh, can walk you through on how to prepare for the assessment, how to identify your threats, do your vulnerability assessment, and then once all that's complete, now what do we do? Do we mitigate it? Do we transfer it? Do we avoid it, okay, or do we just say, hey, I accept it? One thing you cannot do, though, is reject or ignore, okay? You can't do that. You have to acknowledge, and you have to tell me what you're going to do, but you just cannot walk away. That's what we call due care, due diligence. You have to maintain that, okay? Uh, you definitely will communicate your results, and maintaining the assessment means you're doing periodic monitoring on a consistent basis, you know, and you'll keep doing this until you decide in a life, which basically means you're no longer going to engage in the activity, okay? So risk evaluation, who makes the final decision, won't be the tech team, and it won't be uh, anybody on the security team, it will be managers, okay? So they will basically take the evaluation that you did from the vulnerability assessment, they'll look at their risk assessment, and then they'll make a final decision, okay? Now, that risk assessment is based on two types of calculations. It's going to be either qualitative or quantitative, okay? And this is where you rank whether or not it's too critical uh, to invest in, or I will accept it, or, oh, okay, we'll look into it, or, yeah, it's really low, so we're okay. So qualitative is more about subject matter experts. So what that basically means is, it really hasn't happened to you, nor do you have real data, but you can use trends, you can use surveys, you can use research, and the fact that you can also ask a subject matter expert that's probably been working, let's say, for example, uh, Microsoft Server. So 
if I've been working with Microsoft Service for 10 years, I'm technically considered a subject matter expert. So before they invest in buying this 2016 server, they may say, hey, Rita, you work with 2016 a lot. What are some of the risk vulnerabilities that exist with that? Or what are some of the impacts that you experience? And I can give my professional opinion. That doesn't mean it's going to happen to you, but at least you're aware of some of the things that, you know, should happen. You also can look at companies that are already using it. What do they say about the product? So you do your research. So qualitative is more about opinionated based. It's, you know, what do you think? Because you don't really have data to work off and really say, oh, you're going to lose $30,000 because it hasn't really happened to you yet. So you, most people do both methods. I'm going to be honest. It's not one or the other. You're probably going to start off qualitative and then end up doing quantitative. But this is as you rank in low, medium, high. Okay. What do you think? And then the next one is the money. This is the one that's going to base it off of real data, you know, that it actually happened. So we have three areas that we look at. Uh, single loss expectancy, which basically looks at asset value, exposure factor. And asset value is how much you totally cost for the asset. So what you purchase, the data, and the upkeep. And then we look at the exposure factor, and that is if the threat happens or if the impact happens, how much of that will be lost? You're looking at impact. So you take the AV, whatever your asset value is, times the exposure factor, and that will tell you how much you will lose if that one incident happens, that single loss expectancy. And then if you try to see what that costs you for the year, you'll take your SLE and the number of times that incident happens, which is your ARO, and that will give you your ALE. So if my server crashed five times, and every time I went down, that was $1,000. So $1,000 is your SLE. ARO will be five, and then the ALE will be five, you know, 5,000 or so, okay? Because you, you know, each time you went down, it was $1,000. So that's how they would calculate that. But they have data to go off of. They have numbers. It either happened to them, or they have something um, where they was able to predict that cost, okay? So that would be more, you know, you got concrete values. It actually happened. So no company do one or the other. Most companies do both. Because you want to have some things that even you, you're considering that won't happen to you, but you need to know. So that's quali uh, qualitative. And then you have things that actually happen to you. You have numbers and statistics, and that's going to be quantitative, okay? <clears throat> Now, once you decide the impact, we decide what to do with it. So we have avoid, transfer, accept, mitigate, and reject. And remember, I told you, you cannot do that last one, okay? So if you're avoiding it, risk factor too high. Or the security solution is more than worth the asset, so there's no point. Transfer, um, security solution is too high for you, but you can transfer it to a third party. Think of like cloud. Accept risk factor really low. So the impact, even if it happens, it is not going to really be an impact to business. But just because you accept the risk, don't mean you do not have to explain that to an auditor why you accepted the risk. You have to really tell, show that it's not going to be a problem. <clears throat> and just know you're still liable if something does happen. Uh, mitigate means you're going to put in controls. You also means you're accepting the risk. And then reject it means you can do that because that means you're not doing your due care and due diligence when you do that. <clears throat> now, as far as some cybersecurity uh, monitoring, okay, these are just some things that you have. And even though I know this was a hour long uh, webinar, I can go on and on about this, but I'm just going to kind of just go through this really fast so I can get some questions. And I, if you guys want to ask me some questions, but when you now that you uh, did your vulnerability assessment, you got all the things in place. Now you need to monitor your environment. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through um, some of the things that you can implement. And again, these uh, slides will be provided for you guys, so you can kind of go back through it and read through it in detail. But I'm just going to kind of go through it so I can make sure I can get you guys questions in if you have any. But starting out, trying to build that secure environment and keep it maintained once you get everything together. Um, you can implement things like NAC, um, that's network access control. 
<clears throat> that will allow you to basically make sure all systems that join the domain stay compliant. So if you're out of date on, like say your antivirus hasn't been up to date or you, you haven't downloaded the latest patch, it will not allow you to join the network. It'll quarantine you, okay? Um, also think about remote people. So people that's remote into your environment, what can you do to make sure they are secure as well? <clears throat> you can do NAT for that. You also can do port security. You can do authentication servers like Radius or TACAC. Okay, so all of those work with NAC. Um, and then you also can decide where to put it. Okay, so if you think about N-band, it'll sit between all your devices and resources and it'll scan anything coming in. Um, it will not pass NAC authentication. It doesn't get to a domain. And then out of band, that will be your remote users. That's going to have to use 802. So that's support security. So you got two methods, internal, and then you got one for remote users. Okay, so it's looking at, again, system health, where it is, uh, role that it plays within the environment, okay? Um, we got firewalls and DMZs you can implement, okay? Remember I told you you have different classifications for those firewalls. So you have Staple, Packet Filter, the new gen, and um, you also have web application firewalls as well. <clears throat> Now, defense through deception. Sometimes it's good to trick people into believing they have something of value. Why is that important? Then you can find out their, tax, uh, their tactics, their techniques, how they got into the environment, how they do pivot points into your network. Uh, so all that stuff works. So you want to do like honey pods, uh, DNS sinkholes, all those things are there to actually trap your attacker. Okay. Um, then we have secure management. That's basically, did you look at all possibilities? What that basically means is wireless, cloud, remote users. Did you look at mobile users, tablets, PCs, every possible way that a person connects to your environment? Did you secure it? Did you lock it down? Don't just think about internal. Think about everybody, okay? Now, the next little session is just about logging. So I would say during your time of reviewing this, again, these are all the ways you can kind of go through. Look at DHCP logs, firewall logs, um, ACLs, window logs. So all this stuff matters. Uh, you want to do footprinting for your website, where all your data sources as far as your logs are located. You have all those different things. So I know I kind of ran out of time because I get so excited with um, dealing with this topic. And it's so much to go over, um, so many details and so much uh, steps. But I do want to open up for you guys to ask me any questions, if you have any, uh, before we close off the webinar. So guys, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A section. Uh, I received a question from uh, from our streams uh, online. Uh, so uh, you gave a very good example of uh, the HR staff going online, posting a job and just uh, you know revealing too much information about the organization and that being a possible threat. So how do you create a culture of cybersecurity in an organization where the non-IT people also, instead of becoming a vulnerability or a threat, they become kind of like your defenders? So if you're in a company, and let's say you're not part of the networking or security team, then it is your job to provide training. So I know people say you do departmental training. So the biggest thing is the most people don't think they need it. So if you think about your average receptionist or your, you know, administrative assistant or executive assistant, you know, they think her job is just okay. Well, his job is just to answer the phone, be supportive of customer service and so forth. But she is the main focus point. She has access to everything. So why did you not put her in a security meeting? And that's what I mean by the lack of knowledge. Most people think because they don't deal with certain things. Oh, well, she doesn't touch a server. She doesn't touch this. She don't need to be in here. Technically, she does. So what most companies need to do is they just need to consider everyone plays a role in security or will affect it. So at some point, everyone needs to be aware of social engineering, what to look for, what not to answer, because you interact with everyone's data at some point. So I would say recommendation for a company 
is just kind of be aware that her role does play into other security elements. And I think that's where all these breaches starting from 2013 to now is getting worse and worse because it's just the people you think are not an important asset in security actually is the reason why you had the breach. Okay. Yep, makes sense. So, all right, guys, uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar. Rita, thank you for a very educational session. Uh, we will uh, we'll probably do another webinar very soon with you uh, okay. on, on the same topic, like uh, how to train the non-ID stuff. Like this just gave me okay. an idea. This, this can be an hour long discussion even more. Uh, okay. So, uh, and if you have any questions, please reach out to us at uh, marketing at quickstart.com or you can reach out to us as at expertconnect.quickstart.com. It's a Q&A discussion board an IT community where you can just ask technical questions and get answers. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Rita, for a great session. Uh, see you guys no next problem. time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.